Hello and welcome to the Vivint Smart Home Inc. Third Quarter 2021 earnings call. My name is Robin and I'll be coordinating your call today. If you would like to ask a question during the presentation, you may do so by pressing star followed by one on your telephone keypad. I will now hand you over to your host, Nate Stubbs, VP of Investor Relations for Vivint Smart Home. Nate, please go ahead. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us to discuss the results of Vivint Smart Home for the three and nine month periods ended September 30th, 2021. Joining me on the conference call this morning are David Bywater, Vivint Smart Home's Chief Executive Officer, and Dale R. Gerard, Vivint's Chief Financial Officer. I would like to begin by reminding everyone that the discussion today may contain forward-looking statements, including with regard to the company's future performance and prospects. Forward-looking statements are inherently subject to risks and uncertainties that can cause actual outcomes or results to differ materially from those indicated in any such statements. We describe some of these risks and uncertainties in the risk factors section in our annual report on Form 10-KA for our fiscal year 2020, in our Form 10-Q that will be filed today, and in other filings we make with the SEC from time to time. The company undertakes no obligation to update or revise publicly any forward-looking statements, whether as a result of new information, future events, or otherwise. In today's remarks, we will also refer to certain non-GAAP financial measures. Reconciliation of these non-GAAP financial measures to the most comparable measures calculated and presented in accordance with GAAP, to the extent available without unreasonable effort, are available in the earnings release and accompanying presentation, which are available on the Investor Relations section of our website. I will now turn the call over to David. Thank you, Nate, and good morning, everyone. I've enjoyed talking with many of you since our last one's call, and I greatly appreciate your interest in the company. Today, we are excited to give you an update on our strong performance for the third quarter, remind you of why we are a leader in the smart home, and provide additional insight on two of our strategic initiatives. After my remarks, I will turn the call over to Dale to take you through the finer details of the third quarter, along with our guidance for the remainder of the year which we are updating given the positive momentum in the business. Before I get into the strong results for the quarter, let me remind you of why we are a leading smart home company and what differentiates Vivint from others in the marketplace. Our mission is to redefine the home experience with technology and services to create a smarter, greener, safer home that saves our customers money every month. What is a smart home? We know that a single device such as a doorbell camera or thermostat doesn't make a home smart. Rather, a smart home has multiple devices, properly located and installed, all tied into an expandable platform that incorporates AI and machine learning in its operating system. Similarly, we don't believe that having a smart speaker in the home is the same as having an AI-driven machine learning operating platform like Vivint. While DIY products and companies get a lot of press, and many believe that DIY is, is a faster growing segment of the industry versus the professionally installed and monitor segment, surveys show that many DIY products purchased never get installed, and over 20% of the products that do get installed are by some other than the purchaser. While DIY might have higher sales growth, we believe it represents only a small percentage of the profit pool. Meanwhile, our growth, which we believe is seven to eight times greater than the professionally installed and monitor segments annual growth is delivering 40% plus adjusted EBITDA margins. I'm very pleased with our third quarter results as we had double-digit year-over-year growth in both revenue and adjusted EBITDA. Our revenue growth was more than double the growth rate in the prior year period, reflecting the robust demand for the products and services we deliver. Many of the underlying metrics of the business show strong improvement year over year. Our last 12 month attrition came in at 11.4%, which was our 13 quarter low and 140 basis point improvement versus the prior year period. While the enhancements in our underwriting criteria and product performance are part of the story, I believe our lower attrition rate is also driven by our smart home platform delivering our mission of providing value and peace of mind to our customers. Another metric we are pleased with is the nearly $78 million in net cash from operating activities during the quarter. 
operating the business with positive net cash from operating activities has been a focus of the entire organization, and we expect to, build, uh, we expect to achieve that goal again in 2021. Our belief is that Devon's business model is superior to others in the industry, both in terms of unit economics as well as the ability to adapt to the changing economic environments, including the recent pandemic and the current labor and supply chain challenges. We believe Devon is truly in a category of one. What do I mean when I say we're in category one? We believe Devon is the only company with a proprietary cloud-based platform, a differentiated end-to-end -end distribution model, strong growth with compelling economics, and multiple levers for sustained profitable growth. Expanding on that, our proprietary cloud-based AI and machine learning platform that we designed, engineered, and can continue to hone forms the nerve center of a truly differentiated end-to-end -end platform. We believe we can integrate new customer offerings from large adjacent markets that logically link back to our smart home platform, compounding the value that we already deliver to our more than 1.8 million customers. With an average of 15 devices installed per home, we own a rich first-party data environment that helps us not only protect our customers, but also improve the efficiency of the homes and elevate their peace of mind. Our confidence in our strategy stems from Devon's unique focus on the importance of owning the entire technology stack and coupling it with the end-to-end -end distribution model that leads to an exceptional customer experience. We believe this is absolutely critical by continuously enhancing our platform, we can delight our customers at every point of interaction with them. As our customer satisfaction increases, the trust in us builds, and this creates multiple potential levers for sustained profitable growth for years to come. Our strategic priorities are focused on leveraging the trust to redefine the home experience with blessing class technology and services to create a smarter, greener, safer home that will save our customers money every month. As we do this, we believe we can transform long-term customer relationships into lifetime customer relationships. We believe this will allow us to extend our average customer life of more than eight years today to something much longer in the future. Even moderate success in that transformation has the potential to meaningfully decrease the attrition of our customer base and increase the lifetime value of our customers. We have a layered strategy for pursuing growth and achieving this vision. Our flagship product offering is Smart Home. Over the years, we have developed a best-in-class solution that levers what we believe is the premier Smart Home offering to the masses. In a world where competitors' definition of a Smart Home begins and ends with a do-it-yourself doorbell, we know it is so much more. DIY customers end up with homes that are inactive and protected by partial solutions, and that isn't smart. We believe customers are better served by having the right systems scoped, installed, and monitored to protect their homes and their families. But to be in a true category one, the platform within the home must allow homeowners to do much more. It should enable them to benefit from new products and services that leverage the smart home ecosystem. That is why we are investing in the development of two linked markets, smart energy and smart insurance. Until now, we've been light on details surrounding these two growth opportunities. Today, I hope to expand your understanding of why we believe smart energy and smart insurance are perfect extensions to our smart home offering and worth our focus and investment. As the first company, as the first smart home company to expand into smart energy, we are working to deliver deeper customer value by offering a comprehensive bundle that subsidizes the cost of smart home and helps protect customers from rising energy costs while being better stewards of the environment. The vision is to create a bundled offering of smart home and smart energy that integrates energy production and consumption data in the Vivint app, allowing customers to intelligently manage their home's energy use. A study performed previously by a premier consulting firm showed that many homeowners are interested in bundling smart home and smart energy. And we are seeing that with our customers as well. We are approaching this opportunity through a dual path strategy that is asset light and sales lead based. Back in July, we announced a partnership with solar finance partners, Sunrun and Mosaic, as well as with Freedom Forever, 
one of the country's largest and fastest growing solar installers. This partnership will enable Freedom Forever to include a Vivint smart home system with each of their solar cells, which will deliver immediate value to the customer. And of course, we expect this to lead to more smart home installs for Vivint. In addition, through our partnership with Freedom Forever and other solar installers, we can offer smart energy to our current customers as well as new customers. We are on pace to generate nearly 45 megawatts of installed solar this year, bringing smart energy to about 5,000 homes. In some markets, we're seeing many instances of smart home customers bundling with smart energy. We believe we can do significantly more in 2022 as we methodically expand our bundled solution in markets where customers benefit from residential solar. Over time, as we integrate the production data from the solar panels with customer behavior patterns, we believe smart energy can drive material savings that will reinforce the value of the Vivid platform. As this catches on, we believe consumers across the country will view our bundle solution of smart home and smart energy as a clear differentiator. I would note that just the EBITDA margins in smart energy are lower than in smart home. So while we'll see incremental growth in adjusted EBITDA dollars, overall margin percentages will be a bit lower as the revenue from smart energy comes in a lower margin. We are okay with this as we believe our ability to leverage subscriber acquisition costs and increase the lifetime value of our customers by addressing an obvious market demand to bundle these two solutions presents a very compelling growth opportunity. Another benefit is that our bundle differentiated smart home and smart energy offering will provide our sales channels with the ability to offer greater value in the products they sell and provide more opportunities to interact with current and potential customers. We will share more details on this opportunity in the upcoming months, but trust me, we believe this is a good adjacent market for us to invest in. Now let me discuss smart insurance. We've been selling our insurance to a limited number of customers for a while now. The logical connection here is that the $600 billion plus property and casualty insurance market has been looking for homeowners analog to the smart driver discount that auto insurance carriers deliver through their telematic solutions and automobiles. We believe that they haven't had that analog. Given the rich first party data that comes from our average customer interacting with our system over 11 times per day and the 15 smart devices in their home, that protect them against water damage, fire, and theft. As we have worked with several leading insurance carriers, we have been encouraged by their eagerness to help us create a home insurance solution that leverages our smart home ecosystem. We believe our platform can help insurance companies better price the risk of a customer that has a professionally installed system in their home that is monitored and used consistently to mitigate the severity of claims events. In short, we should be able to demonstrate to insurers that Vivint customers present a lower risk than homeowners without a smart home system or a DIY system that was inadequately scoped and installed. To date, we have been operating as an agency, reselling insurance products from a few large carriers, and we're on pace to sell approximately 8,000 insurance policies in 2021. To better leverage our smart home platform and provide the opportunity for additional savings for consumers, we are working to become a managing general agent which will allow us to develop specific homeowner coverages for our customers. We believe we can potentially double the number of policies sold in 2022 and provide a higher level of customer-specific coverages through our MGA insurance offerings in some of our larger states. As we demonstrate the savings and benefits of our proprietary coverages, we believe we can expand into most states over the next several years. We will expand in a thoughtful and deliberate manner as we prove to our customers the benefits that it can provide in protecting their homes, their families, and their wallets. We are focused on accelerating long-term growth through each of these adjacencies. Meanwhile, we will maintain a sharp focus on our core smart home business. We consider these opportunities to be natural extensions of our core smart home offering. We believe we have the tools, technology, and capabilities to not only deliver value through an elegant smart home experience, but to save our customers money throughout innovative energy and insurance solutions. Our vision is to be the preferred operating system in the home and a true platform play. We believe customers trust us to protect their homes, their families, and the environment 
while also helping them save money. As we do this, we believe we will benefit from scaling subscriber acquisition costs, increasing the lifetime value of each customer, and increasing the number of years customers are on the Vivid platform. We are excited about the road ahead and remain confident that the robust growth potential of our core business model, along with the adjacencies we're pursuing, will put us in a position to deliver long-term sustainable value for our shareholders. I will now turn the call to Dale to discuss the details of the third quarter financial results, as well as our updated guidance for the full year. Dale. Thanks, David. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining the conference call. This morning, I will provide detail for our third quarter and year-to-date operating and financial results. I will also provide updated thoughts on our guidance for the full year. We will open the call for a Q&A session after my prepared remarks. Before I dive into the numbers, I want to address the delay in reporting our third quarter results. While reviewing certain customer contract transactions during the quarter into September 30, 2021, we identified a material weakness in our internal controls over financial reporting related to the timing of revenue recognition resulting in certain immaterial errors in previously reported amounts of revenue. Specifically, we found that we did not properly design and maintain effective controls in the quarter ended September 30, 2021, as well as prior reporting periods to accurately determine the appropriate period to recognize revenue associated with certain transactions. These transactions primarily related to monthly service charge adjustments and contract modifications which resulted in errors in the reporting of revenue and other income and balance sheet items in certain prior periods. The company assessed the material healthy of the misstatements by both quantitatively and qualitatively and determined that the correction of these errors to be immaterial to all prior consolidated financial statements, taken as a whole, and therefore amending previously filed reports to correct the errors was not required. However, the company concluded that the cumulative effect of correcting the errors in the quarter in September 30, 2021, would materially mistake the company's unaudited, convinced, consolidated financial statements for the three and nine months into September 30, 2021. Accordingly, the company has reflected the corrections of the immaterial errors in the results for prior periods included in the financial statements an unaudited earnings release, the company presentation, as well as its quarterly report on Form 10-Q that will be filed today. The company will also revise such information in future filings to reflect the correction of the errors. I refer you to our Form 10-Q that will be filed today for more details. In conjunction with this call, we, proposed, we posted a presentation to our investor relations website that provides additional context on the quarter. On slide 10 of the presentation, we highlight a few of our key subscriber portfolio metrics. Total subscribers grew nicely from September 30, 2020, up 9.2% to 1.84 million as of September 30, 2021. Average monthly reoccurring revenue per user, or AMRU, increased by 4.7% versus the prior year period, driven by customers purchasing more smartphone and security products at the point of sale. The combination of the growth in total subscribers and the growth in AMRU, along with a few other items, lifted total monthly reoccurring revenue by 15.1% year over year to $121.5 million. Now moving to revenue for the three month and nine month periods in September 30, 2021 on slide 11. For the third quarter of 2021, revenue was $386.7 million, a 21.3% increase from the prior year period. The primary drivers of the year over year revenue growth were an increase in total subscribers, an increase in the average monthly reoccurring revenue per user, and contributions from our smart energy and smart insurance initiatives. The 21.3% revenue growth in the third quarter of 2021 
was more than double the 9.6% growth rate in the third quarter of 2020. Revenue for the nine months into September 30, 2021 was $1.08 billion, an increase of 17.6% from the nine month period in the prior year. December to the third quarter, the key drivers of growth in the nine month period were growth in total subscribers, growth in AMRRU, and contributions from our smart energy and smart insurance initiatives. Now turning to slide 12, I will, adjust, I will discuss just and off for the third quarter and year-to-date periods. For the third quarter, adjusted EBITDA grew 10.7% to $170.4 million, with an adjusted EBITDA margin of 44.1%. I would note that adjusted EBITDA margins in smart energy and smart insurance are lower than our smart home margins. We are very pleased overall with the solid EBITDA margins achieved in the face of inflationary pressures in today's economic environment. I would note included in the third quarter results are approximately $9 million of investments in brand awareness, new product and service innovation, and IT enhancements. Moving to the nine months into September 30, 2021, adjusted EBITDA grew 13% from the same period in 2020. This includes approximately $20 million of investment spend associated with brand awareness, new product and service innovation, and IT enhancement. Since 2020 results have a lot of noise related to the COVID-19 pandemic, we believe it's instructive for investors to look at the comparison of adjusted EBITDA growth in the three and nine months of 2021 versus the same periods in 2019. Adjusted EBITDA in the three and nine months of 2021 grew by more than 64% compared to the same periods in 2019. We have also been able to expand our adjusted EBITDA margin from the mid 30% range in 2019 to the mid 40% range in 2021. Now moving to slide 13, I'll highlight a few metrics around new subscriber originations. New subscriber originated during the third quarter of 2021 were 114,056. Our direct to home sales channel was lower than the previous third quarter, driven largely by the impact of COVID that COVID had on the timing of the selling season in 2020, as the 2020 selling season was extended through September of last year. Our National Inside Sales Channel, or NIS, and year-over-year -year growth of 7.6% in the third quarter of 2021 compared to the third quarter of 2020. For the nine-month period ended September 30, 2021, NIS originations grew by over 18%, and the company added 295,782 new subscribers, up 3.8% from the same period in 2020. We are pleased with the consistent growth in the NIS channel over the past few years and believe it is a strong indicator of the value that customers see in the business smart home platform. Within all of the origination channels, we continue to focus on underwriting high quality, profitable customers. For the third quarter of 2021, more than 99% of new subscribers either paid in full or financed the purchase of their equipment through one of our financing partners. I will now cover net service and net subscriber acquisition costs on slide 14. Net service cost per subscriber for the third quarter of 2021 was $10.49, up slightly from a record low in the third quarter of 2020, but down almost $4 from the same period in 2019. Net service margin in the third quarter of 2021 remained robust at 77.7%. I'm pleased that our customer experience and field operations groups have been able to provide our customers a delightful experience while managing costs, as customer interactions in our call centers and ambulance service business rebounded from the abnormally low levels during the height of the pandemic last year. The introduction of 
the flex based model has allowed us to achieve a significant reduction in net subscriber acquisition costs per new subscriber over the past few years. Net subscriber acquisition costs per new subscriber for the period ended September 30, 2021, decreased by 52.2% to $100. This is a $109 reduction from the prior year period, while the average proceeds collected at the point of sale increased to almost $2,200. Moving to slide 15, our last 12 months of attrition rate was 11.4% for the period ended September 30, 2021. 140 basis points lower than the same period last year and is at a 13 quarter low for customer attrition. We believe the continued improvement in attrition is related to our enhanced underwriting standards and the increased interactions of our customers with the platform. In terms of cash or operating activities, we had another solid quarter at nearly $78 million. I would note that our cash and operating activities in the quarter in the nine month periods includes the impact of the change in the timing of payments to one of our financing partners, as well as our investments in brand awareness, new product and service innovation, and IT enhancements. At the end of the quarter, we had a solid liquidity position of approximately $635 million. In July, we completed a global refinancing of our existing debt structure which decreased our total debt outstanding by approximately $90 million, lowered our average cost of debt by nearly 200 basis points, and increased our revolving credit facility from $334 million to $370 million. We expect the refinancing to save the company approximately $50 million in annualized interest expense. Before providing an updated thoughts on guidance, I want to give a little bit more perspective on our expectations for cash flow from operating activities. As we have discussed over the last year, we plan to operate the business on a cash flow positive basis. We will use the excess cash flow to, among other things, fund sales growth initiatives, pursue new adjacencies such as smart energy and smart insurance, invest in new product and service innovation, and reduce outstanding debt. When comparing cash flow in 2021 to 2020, it's important to note that cash flow from operating activities in 2020 benefited from COVID-induced cost reductions, some permanent and some temporary. In 2021, we have seen many of the temporary cost reduction initiatives come back into our run rate, and we have seen inflationary pressures in labor and material costs. We also pushed through a price increase on our starter pack at the beginning of the pandemic in 2020. Another significant change in cash flow from operating activities from 2020 to 2021 has to do with the change in the way we pay financing fees and anticipated credit losses to one of our financing partners, switching from paying over the term of the loan to upfront at the time of the financing. This will also have an impact on cash flow from operating activities in 2022 as we layer the full impact of the change in over 2021 and 2022. Finally, in terms of guidance for the full year, we believe there is a lot of positive momentum in our business, and we remain very optimistic about the rest of the year, despite notable headwinds related to supply chain disruptions, inflationary pressure, and labor constraints. We are updating our guidance for the full year as follows. Total subscribers in the range of 1.84 to 1.85 million versus previous guidance of between 1.8 and 1.85 million. Total revenue in the range of 1.4 to 1.46 billion dollars. Above the previous guidance between 1.38 to 1.42 billion dollars. And finally, Adjusted EBITDA in the range of $650 to $660 million versus previous guidance of between $640 to $655 million. Robin, this concludes our prepared remarks. Please open the call for Q&A. Thank you. 
If you would like to ask a question, please press star followed by one on your telephone keypad now. If you change your mind and would like to withdraw your question, please press star followed by two. When preparing to ask your question, please ensure your phone is unmuted locally. Our first question comes from Rod Hall from Goldman Sachs. Rod, please go ahead. Your line is open. Hi, this is RK on behalf of Rod. Thanks for taking my question. and Nice job on the results and all the color on the smart energy and smart insurance. So I want to start there. I wanted to ask on the economics of the smart energy offering. So how exactly will you generate the smart energy revenue? And how much lower are the margins? And on insurance, can you also talk about the business models you considered? Are you offering Vivint branded insurance, or will this be more of a partnership with third-party providers? And I have a follow-up. Thank you. Yeah, so, so I'll, I'll take the, the uh, margin stuff, and then David can jump in here around how, how, we're, how we're thinking about whether it's a Vivint branded or, or or, or not on the, on the smart insurance. In terms of margins, as any um, kind of new emissions that you go into, that, you know, you start out, um, you've got to build some scale on those to be able to come up with those margins. And so we expect margins in smart energy and smart insurance to improve as we continue to build those out. Um, you know, what, what I would say is the, the, the revenue associated with kind of those two initiatives in the third quarter, um, was approximately helped contribute probably five to six percent of our revenue growth of the 21 percent was related to those initiatives. Um, and, and you know, again, we're we're not probably ready to tell you all the economics around those, but, but um, as we continue to build those out, we will expand those. But but as you can imagine, solar industry, this is kind of common. You can all look across this. Those margins are less um, than what we would see in our smart home industry. And I think it's also important to realize we're doing an asset life business here. We're not we're not doing it solar installs. It's more of a sales uh, approach as we're generating leads, and so we're getting paid, you know, for the, the leads that we generate um, across our platform. Uh, and so forth. So I don't know, David, if you have anything more on, on either one of those two topics. No, I, I like our approach there. I mean, the customers are interested in bundling the two. Um, you know, I'm excited that. See a scale acquisition cost more, and uh, frankly, just give customers more value because uh, they definitely see them as a bundle solution, or many of them do. Um, I think, with regards to the second question around the branding, right now it is branded Vivint, uh, you know, uh, Vivint Energy and Vivint Smart Insurance and Smart Energy. Um, we'll continue to evaluate that to see if we want to brand anything differently, but as of right now, just given where it is in the incubation cycle, um, we've kept them under the Vivint brand. And, and we'll evaluate if that makes um, more sense or less sense over time. But as of right now, they are been branded um, with the option to change it if it makes sense. Thank you. Appreciate all the color there. And on the quarter itself, I wanted to touch on new subscriber growth. It's down 10% year on year, and you mentioned that it's a difficult comp for DTH. So can you comment on linearity? And how should we think about a normalized rate of growth for new subscribers? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I think so, so again, direct to home, you know, I think when you go back and kind of do comparisons year over year, direct to home is a difficult comparison because again, we got started late last year uh, in terms of we didn't really start slowly to the May. It extended all the way through uh, September and kind of had a full season, which normally that season ends towards the end of August. Um, and I think there's also a lot of pressure around, uh, you know, difference in 2021, maybe than 2022, or excuse me, 2020. There's also the pre rep average. You, you know, you get, you've seen kind of pre rep average drop come back to kind of what we saw historically back in 2019 versus 2020 was, uh, was slightly higher. Again, I think that was related to the fact that you had, uh, more people who were home, both, both home, both, uh, Decision makers in the home were home in 20 versus 21 as people started to go back into their offices and go back to, to, to work from normal locations. Uh, so all those kind of come together. Um, what I what I think we would expect to see out of both our channels is kind of 10% plus growth on an annualized basis. That's what that's what our targets are. Going to continue to grow those channels. Um, and so you know we've seen really good growth in NIS. We've actually seen good growth in. Uh, and direct the home, 
uh, in different periods. But when we look at this and think about 2022 and, and, and beyond, we'd like to see again 10% or greater annualized growth in both those channels. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks, okay. Thanks. Have a good day. Thank you. Our next question comes from Paul Chung from JP Morgan. Paul, please go ahead. Your line is now open. Hi, uh, thanks for taking my questions and, and very nice top line here. So on your average monthly revenue, you know, it's trended quite nice this year. So, you know, what's what are customers buying more of today? A kind of driven strength there. Um, and then as we think about insurance and solar initiatives, how does that monthly revenue um, you know, kind of per user accelerate from here? And then are there any price increases that we should think about in the near term as well? I think I'll take the first part and then uh, deal with the second half. Um, you know, we continue to see a really strong demand for cameras in particular in the smart home in our core business. Um, you know, we've invested heavily there. We think that uh, the experience you have with our cameras are quite uh, unique. Um, I'm not sure if you've seen them or not, but they not only focus on recording the events, but they also focus on deterring negative events. Uh, this morning as I came into work, uh, you know, I had my camera, thought I was an intruder because it was, uh, you know, I was moving around my house earlier and outside my house uh, earlier than normal. And, uh, you know, it's a very smart, I'm going to about AI and, and just a smart camera. You know, when the light come on, when it whistles and records you, and then it gives you um, a diagnostic. As I was driving to work, I saw I, I a stop sign. I was safe. I was looking down my phone. You know, it, it, it helps summarize that it thought there might have been an intruder at my house because it was outside that norm. So, you know, that plus other things, there's just been a much higher uh, appetite by our customers for our cameras. Um, so you've seen that average device in the home increase. So we're really focused on making sure that we you know, deliver what they want, but also properly scope that home and install all the devices um, appropriately. But the, I think the cameras is really been driving that nicely year over year. Yeah, in terms of the, the way we'll recognize the smart um, insurance and smart energy revenue, currently that will be recognized in period. That's, that's not not reoccurring revenue. That's a, that's kind of one-time revenue associated with those kind of cards where our business model set up there. Um, so I think that addresses that question. Did, did you have one other question? Yeah, well, yeah. no, that, that, that's good. And then just to follow up on the insurance, you know, how large can that business kind of contribute over time? Um, you know, your your data is there, so the cost side doesn't seem too incremental. But you know, how the margin in this part of the business, how material. Um, can this be a, as a part of your overall uh, user base? You know, so we can see that, you know, so, yeah, so as I mentioned in my comments, right now we've just been doing an agency model and helping them, you know, work with a variety of customers, make sure they got the right best price solution out there. As we move towards this MDA model, where you actually leverage the ecosystem that we have, um, meaning that, you know, with all the sensors we have in the home, we can tell the state of the home better than I think anyone else. Uh, we're on occupancy, and then just the the how well developed our ecosystem is in the home. You know, around flood, fire, or theft, we think we can protect it better. Um, so, as a consumer has the right system, it's properly scoped and installed. Um, they use our system, uh, you know, uh, quite a bit. Um, and then we know that their occupancy of the home, we can determine that occupancy at the time. You know, we believe that we can fundamentally change the risk profile of what um, they're buying around PNC insurance. So as we prove that out, um, we think that we can you know, drive material savings to them. So I, I share that because the, the adoption rate we think can be quite material. Um, you know, once again, what's so beautiful about that is it's, it's re reinforcing. As you show a customer that as they use the system correctly, it should reduce their uh, insurance premiums. They'll use the system more. The more they use it, um, the, you know, the more savings they have, and the more likely that they'll remain a customer with us for a long time. So we really like that reinforcing um, mechanism between the two. Um, and I don't know. You know, we'll, we'll know more next year. I like to prove it before I talk about it, but we think it'll be a pretty high, a pretty material attach rate. 
um, as we as we demonstrate that value to them. And what we've seen so far is a high appetite for customers, the ones that we've approached, um, that they trust us, that they we're helping them make a better selection, and they see the logic in the connection with the smart home. How fast will grow will depend, you know, it's state by state, it's a highly regulated industry. And so you got to roll out state by state correctly with uh, great controls. Um, and we'll be thoughtful. We'll go to our biggest states first, and then we'll work across the entire country. Um, so we believe that over the next, you know, three to four years, we should be in, you know, most, if not all states. And last, last one for me, I mean, it's a similar question for the solar. What, per, you know, penetration rate do you expect for your existing subs and new subs over time? And then, you know, your near peer, you know, made a large acquisition here. So you're seeing this kind of secular shift with you guys and, and your competitor for a bundled solution here. So, you know, how can you capture a share in a, in a more uh, competitive environment? And then, um, you know, how are you making the purchase decision very simple for a customer, um, which, you know, sometimes can be somewhat complex? Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Great question. Um, on the uh, smart energy side, you know, we, we think that we were the first one out there in a material way with the with what we announced with um, Sun and Mosaic and Freedom. Um, we've had a very strong demand um, for that um, with our customers. I know the solar industry quite well. Obviously, given my five years over at Vivint Solar before we sold that to Sunrun. And um, you have to be really mindful of the economics for the customers. Um, you know, unfortunately, um, solar doesn't pencil nicely in every state. There's, you know, 20 or so states that that pencils um, and, and a pretty, you know, good way for the customer. So we're going to focus on those states. Uh, you know, we're following, obviously, where both Sunrun and Mosaic and Freedom are. Um, it's around 25 states today. It's growing as we continue to reduce the cost and the customer acquisition cost. You can make it pencil nicely in the additional states. So, you know, I think that your first guide there should be kind of what are the states that those were sold being sold today. It's roughly 24, 25 states. Um, we're differentially focusing on the states where you have the deepest savings. But, you know, we have a very large customer base in the southern states, which is also a nice overlay where it makes a lot of sense for solar. Um, and once again, we think the penetration there, the, 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 uh, the bundle in there can be, you know, um, material for us. Um, you know, it's, it's probably going to be, you know, less than 50%, but definitely more than 10%. So we'll be in that range. Uh, and we'll have more detail as we prove it out over time. But the momentum we've seen thus far has been nice. It's only been with a partial focus on it. We really haven't opened it up uh, for broad-based adoption with our sales force. But you'll see throughout 2022, we'll open that up more and more and more. Um, and what we're seeing is people lead with smart home. They love to buy the smart home, and then it's an easy set and close, an easier set and close on the solar side. Um, and the combination of those two is resonating with uh, a fair number of our customers. And you want to add that though? So I love thing on that is like our, our partnerships with Freedom Forever, for example, every one of their customers that buy solar. So they're actually selling the solar and then they're including a, a business smart home uh, system in that. So we, we expect there to be growth coming out of that that's kind of driven outside of our sales force, um, but, but through that partnership. So we, we kind of see both sides where we can go to our current customers and new customers that we're selling smart home, plus pick up the smart home growth from, from uh, freedom selling of solar to those customers, to other customers. What's so compelling about this, um, and we talk about the logical adjacencies, is, uh, and we'll share more detail in 2022, but uh, we're seeing a, you know, a substantial increase in the number of customers that stay sticky on, on the solar side when you do a, we call it same day solar. So what's so nice about this is they sell and then we install our smart home within a day or two of the sell. And the customer see immense value from that. And then we say, you know, the, solar, the, the, the install started and then when the solar is installed, depending upon jurisdiction, whether it's 30 days, 45 days, or 60 days, they vary by state and by municipality. Um, they get the second half of the install. Um, and so they're seeing value much earlier. Their propensity to follow through on that is much higher. Their overall customer experience is much higher. So we're seeing material benefits from a customer perspective 
And when you think about that, when you have a higher yield on your on your funnel, um, you're able to subsidize the cost of that smartphone. So we're seeing true win-win-win. It's definitely benefiting the customers. It's definitely benefiting our us and the cost of the company, and then obviously um, benefiting our shareholders. So very encouraged by that. Um, you'll definitely see it develop more. We feel like we've got a good lead on others that are trying to enter this space, and we're very, very, very pleased with our partnerships and how they're evolving. Great. Thanks so much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from Ashish Sabadra from RBC Capital Markets. Ashish, please go ahead. Your line is now open. Uh, thanks for taking the question, and let me add my congrats as well to a strong momentum in the quarter. Uh, maybe just a quick clarifying. Um, we've heard about the tight labor market and supply chain constraint. I was just wanted to confirm, have you seen any impact on your ability to add new customer or upgrade your customers because of um, because of the labor market and the supply chain constraints? You know, uh, she said, David, um, so, you know, they're definitely real. Um, both supply chain and labor constraints are real. Um, so I don't want to discount that at all. Our team has done a really good job of being proactive and thoughtful um, um, on both fronts. Um, you know, we're up substantially on, for instance, our, our, our uh, field professionals, our recruiting team, our operations team, um, I think we're up, you know, 200 heads since we were at the end of the summer. So they've really done a good job of working to, to make sure people understand our value proposition, what we stand for. And I think our mission of protecting families, protecting homes, protecting our other wallets is, is resonating. And they, they like our platform where we're going. So uh, definitely, uh, definitely a challenge but that's what we get paid to do, is to work through these challenges. And I'm really proud of our team on how they're managing through that. On the supply chain, same thing. Um, they're real. Um, you know, we deal with this week to week. We've been going with our, our with many of our, our, our suppliers. And as we lay out for them our roadmap of where we're going, the products that we're bringing to market, how innovative they are, um, our vendors have been saying, hey, you, you approach us very differently. We love your roadmap. We love what you're doing. And they want to partner with us uh, in the future, which is not very far off. Our new products will come out in 2022. We got that very excited. And I think that helps us get a, uh, you know, a better uh, in queue with regards to current supply. So once again, there's real challenges. I don't mean to discount that. But our team is exceptional. I've been very, very impressed with how they've managed through this and continue to manage through it. They include me and Dale uh, selectively with certain vendors. And, um, you know, those partnership conversations have been very, very positive. Once again, they see our roadmap, our momentum, um, the robustness of our model, um, our growth. And uh, it's really helped us, I think, manage through this better than I had expected uh, when I first took over class six months ago. So still have challenges in the future. It's not over. You know, we think these challenges will uh, continue to manifest themselves throughout 2022. I hope by, you know, some point in this next year, they'll be alleviated much more than they are today. But our team, you know, kudos to them. They've done an incredible job. That's very helpful, color, David. And maybe, Dale, a quick question for you on the, free ca on the cash flow. Um, I understand there are some uh, one-off items weighing on the cash flow in 21, some investments and changes. Uh, and we talked about some of those uh, changes in the financing agreement weighing on 22. But as we think about the midterm, is there a way to think about the EBITDA conversion or how do we think about uh, cash flow from operations over the midterm? Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I think um, it's a good, good question. I think for 21, um, you know, we, we just did $78 million in the, in the third quarter. Um, fourth quarter, as you go back historically, look, has always been um, a use of, of cash, and that's what we pay our uh, back end commissions and, and, and so forth. I think for the full year, I think we're, you know, we're looking at that kind of probably full year cash flow for operating activities is in that kind of call it uh, 60 to $75 million range. Uh, and then I think we would look to grow that going into 2022. Uh, again, it's the focus of the whole organization. This isn't just a finance initiative. It's across the organization, all of our leadership. Um, it's something that's part of kind of you know, uh, 
I like to use this word, but it's kind of our core DNA is that, hey, we want to operate our business put on, you know, sustained, profitable growth that generates cash flow from that. Uh, and so that's kind of where our focus is as we look across whether it's investments that we're making either today or in the future types of adjacencies. That's why we're so, you know, high on kind of the smart energy and smart insurance. We believe these adjacencies both come with really good cash flow dynamics. Uh, and, and so they, 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 they're incremental or creating, I guess, to cash flow, not. And so when we look at new um, adjacencies, new products, new services, those are the type of, it's one of the factors that we factor in as we think about, hey, where we want to go, what do we want to offer to our customers? Um, and so that's kind of where we are, or I will give you an update kind of on cash flow from our Yeah, I'm going to add a little bit of that. I mean, when you think about the our DNA and what we focus on, you know, we're really focusing on growth above market in our, our segment. So this professionally installed and monitor market where we the majority of the profit pool is in this smart home arena is, you know, we want to show consistent growth above market. We definitely want to continue to scale the business. Um, and so, you know, we can, we're, we're trying to help make sure that those economics flow through to the bottom line. You know, we're very interested in growing the lifetime value of the customers, right? Demonstrating the platform play here that we've talked about. Um, it's very exciting for our company internally to see the platform play taking hold and growing. Um, we love smart home. We love how well that's performing. And then these adjacencies, you know, it's exciting for our, our employees as they see the platform play manifested. So that'll come through lifetime value of the customer. And then the last point on Dell, you know, it's cash flow generation. Um, guys, I, you know, we can grow <laughs> like crazy uh, with poor unit economics and poor cash generation. That's not how you want to grow a business, right? We want to grow a business where we also show you guys that the cash flow generation improves you know, year after year after year um, as you get the machine stronger and stronger and stronger. So, you know, really it's above market growth. It's really a scaled um, business model. It's really LTV and the platform play. And it's cash generation. Those are things that we're focused on in the as a company. And I think as investors, uh, those are things you want to focus on. That's very helpful, Kalar. Thank you very much. And congrats once again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from Eric Woodring from Morgan Stanley. Eric, please go ahead. Your line is now open. Thank you so much, and congrats on the good quarter, guys. Um, just wanted to get to, you know, you guided the year roughly, you know, kind of early August. So what did you see kind of in the last two months of the quarter that uh, that allowed you to materially outperform, you know, and raise your full year expectations? And then I have a follow-up. Thanks. Yeah, I think, Eric, this is the I think, you know, as we said at the Q2 earnings call in early August, that, that you know we were we were bullish on what the year would look like, but there were still some some headwinds out there around supply chain labor constraints. I think as David said, we've managed really well through those uh, in the third quarter and even early here in the fourth quarter. And so you know we were able to have what what I think was a really good third quarter in terms of all of our performance across our metrics. And so that gives us kind of the insight in as we're you know. I mean, we're sitting here, I guess, 55 days or whatever it is, 50 days from the end of the year. Uh, we feel really good about, you know, where we think the full year will be, and that's, that's why we took our guidance up. Again, you know, when you look at things, attrition continues to form really well. So, you know, so subscribers, or end of the year subscribers, is going to come in again at the high end of the range. Um, we've been able to, like, even with all of the different things going on, you know, be able to keep our EBITDA margins in that mid 40, you know, mid 40 percent, which gives us what we see in the growth again was to, to go to increase those to EBITDA ranges to up to 660, uh, 660 million dollars. Um, so, so again, revenue with the addition of the of smart home continues to grow. I mean, we've seen really good growth year over year when you look at just smart home revenue that, from that business, and then you add in these two adjacencies that are really starting to contribute. To, to in a meaningful way to our revenue that allows us to again go back and look at that and say, hey, based on where we are today, we feel very confident in, in increasing that target or that guidance also. So just pulling all those things back together, I 
think where we were starting in August, again, David has been here at that point, maybe 60 days, maybe 75 days. Um, and we still were thinking about strategy and how we're executing for the rest of the year, uh, looking at some of those headwinds are out there. We've been able to navigate that and feel very good where we are uh, for the rest of 21. And frankly, you know, we're working on what we think 2022 will be, uh, and, and we're excited uh, where, where we're headed in terms of the momentum we have going into 2022. Okay, that's really helpful. And then, um, obviously, you know, amazing job on the nutrition side. You know, where do you guys think that can end this year? And then, you know, directionally, how should we think about that going into uh, 2022? You know, there's two things on a trip. So our, our operations teams, you know, kudos to them. Um, they've executed really, really well. I appreciate all they do. But, uh, you know, there's always two big factors here. There's always where you are in the cycle with uh, customers. Um, so what, what cohorts coming out of contract, what cohorts going into, what was the growth rate back then? So that's one thing. And then the second thing is, um, you know, what we're trying to do here, which is can you provide more value to those customers? The more you can provide value to them, the better off you are. And, and the thing that our company is super excited about is, you know, we've always been great. We've been phenomenal at protecting family and homes, right? Just really, really good. But it came at a cost. Um, and we think that we earned that and better than anyone um, with the solutions we brought. But now as you bundle in these other logical adjacencies that really fit nicely with the platform, you know, if you roll in solar, you should save your customers money. You roll in an EV charger, you should save them money. As you roll in insurance and they see the benefit um, with our overall ecosystem at home, you should save them money. So, you know, in some situations, you may offset a portion of that expense to save the family, to protect the family in the home. In other situations, you may far exceed that. You now have a very positive um, savings proposition. If you're in that situation where you're saving, you're protecting the family, the home, the earth, and their wallet, they're not going anywhere. They shouldn't go anywhere, right? If you, if you, if you uh, execute well, you take care of that customer, they should say, wait a minute, I'm protecting all of this, and I'm better off financially. So, you know, as we work to feather that into the overall portfolio and deliver it consistently across all of our customers, um, you know, we hope that will actually have a very positive impact on attrition. That will take some time, right? I don't mean that that's going to be done overnight, but that will take some time. But the roadmap, as you help the customers see that, I mean, and we can see it execute nicely, um, you know, we hope that the, the, net, the net net of those two things will, uh, will benefit us over time. So, I, you know, Doug, you may have more. Yeah, but I, I, I think that, that's exactly right, David. That's, that's kind of how, that's why we really feel that all of this customer interaction, customer experience we have on our platform or something that, along with, you know, as we mentioned, the enhanced underwriting and some of the changes we've made over the last few years. Uh, and again, the infant earlier, we, we can open that underwriting funnel back up and grow, you know, you know, multiples of the way we're growing today. But, but we don't believe that's the right thing for the for the business, for the shareholders. And so we continue to tweak that underwriting and make those advancements around that. Um, when, when you look at attrition for the rest of this year, um, I, you know, we're probably somewhere in the range we are right now, I, I, I would say. Uh, and as David said, attrition will probably go up a little bit as we go into uh, 2022. When I say a little bit, probably gets into the high 11s, maybe low 12. Again, that's not a change in the, in the co that's a cohort in the term. And so your end of terms have higher attrition. That's, that's historically, that's across you know, what we've seen, but that's not, that doesn't, our, our attrition is actually not changing. It's just the mechanics of where, as David mentioned, the, the cohorts are in their end of term, what the number of cohorts were that are at the end of term because of the growth rate we've had in that year versus other years. Um, but we're, we're really excited about where our attrition is and where we think it can go, as David said, as we add these other adjacencies, bringing in more value to the consumer. Um, you know, we're, we're, David is not only part of the, you know, protecting their, their families, but it's also helping them get savings on insurance. It's bringing energy to their home and helping them manage their energy usage inside their home, which drives other savings. We think there's lots of benefits across this model. And that, as David said, we believe that over time that will prove out in our attrition rate. Yeah, so we're, we're trying to engineer these structural changes that will help us over time in material, materially impact attrition. 
But, you know, if you go back to the mission statement, right, we're trying to redefine the home experience with technology and services. It's the boat with technology and services to create a smarter, greener, safer home that saves our customers money every month. Like, that's a fundamental shift, a positive shift for our customers. And then, you know, uh, you've heard us earlier, we're trying to transform, which we already think are long-term customer relationships into lifetime customer relationships. And that's, that's pretty aspirational for us. But that's what gets us motivated, right? We don't want to have a customer. We think that customer right now of eight to nine years is remarkable when your contract's five. Awesome. So grateful for that. But, you know, if we, as we execute on this, you know, could you see our average lifetime going up by a multiple of that? Absolutely. You could. Um, so we've got to go execute, got to execute flawlessly. We've got to make sure that we are, you know, bringing the right solutions and delivering every day. But as we do that, we think we truly will redefine this experience. And this platform playing the home will actually bear immense fruit. Um, and that is what's got us as a company, um, everyone focused on making that happen on a scalable basis. So, you know, that's what we got to go execute on. No, that's great. Uh, I really appreciate the color, guys. Thanks, uh, thanks again, and uh, congrats on the great quarter. Thanks, Eric. Thank you. Our next question comes from Amit Ziryanani from Evercore. Amit, please go ahead. Your line is now open. Uh, thank you. Uh, you know, I guess I have a couple of questions. First off, uh, you talked about EBITDA margins being lower for new offerings like energy and insurance. Uh, can you maybe just talk about where are they versus the 44% number you just printed? And then are they lower because these are subscale assets or you know, revenue streams that you have? Or are they going to be structurally lower even when you get to scale? Yeah, so so I think I have a question. Um, but the margins from the, the revenue generated from the smart insurance and the smart energy are included in the 44%. So, so, so you know, if we didn't have that, our smart home margins would have probably been a little higher. Again, we're building up these kind of new initiatives, and so we're not at scale with the startup costs associated with getting these, these initiatives up and going. And so those are in the, in the model today uh, that we expect over time that, that you, would, you would see that we build scale and improve those, uh, those margins associated uh, from, from those businesses. Again, we're not, I'm not going to go into the exact margins today. <laughs> Um, we're, what I will say is we're excited about where, this, where those adjacents are taking it. We think there's more value than just the, the margins of the bottom line in terms of the overall customer relationship. And David said is we can, if we can extend the relationship with a smart home customer that, that has, you know, 78% service margins, we, we, you know, whether it's a year, two, five more years, we think that incrementally adds to the, to the overall uh, business and the profitability of the business. So I think that's kind of where we are. Because we'll, we'll get more details as we go and continue to scale out these two initiatives around some of the unit economics. But, but today, we're, gonna, we're, we're not going to give out any more we already have. But LTV, we'll focus yeah. we'll, we'll, yeah, really about LTV. Like one value, uh, that's really what we focus on. I guess the attraction of extending uh, the duration of these customers by these new offerings, right? There's, there's logic to that. Uh, but I'm wondering, you know, as a company, you have finite resources, money to deploy. Why not double down and expand the number of subs you have from 1.8 million to something bigger, kind of in the core of what you do, which is going into adjacencies where it sounds like it's a more margin proposition. Uh, you know, I guess I'm trying to understand why, why not go after new subs more aggressively rather than expanding new offerings? Well, we're, we're, we're not, we're, we're doing both. I mean, absolutely, the smart home, the, our, as you say, our flagship business, we're absolutely doubling down. I mean, you think about the new products we're bringing out, absolutely doubling down. We're not taking our foot off that at all. Um, we think it differentiates us immensely and provides us a great opportunity to go, you know, bring on more customers. So if we gave that impression, we didn't mean to. We're absolutely doubling down on smart home and the product suite and the channels we're going after and growth on every channel. So um, absolutely full thrust. But at the end here, we're, we're, we're focused on delighting the customer. And when you think about delighting the customer, 
Um, they want to bundle more, and we think once again this transition to be able to help them save money and protect their family, their home, the earth, which are logical, and their wallet, we think it's a superior solution. So, you know, with, with smart home we love, we're investing in, absolutely growing it. Um, these adjacencies not only make it stickier for those customers, but also introduce you to more customers for smart home. So solar is great. Solar helps it make stickier. Those are 30-year contracts, 35-year contracts of saving money. And if it's integrated into our app and they see both, I mean, think about it. You know, if you're in California where time of use rates are changing all the time, and our system can actually help that customer, they know with a high probability when that customer's getting home, they can do the math on how to use rates. We can help them consume better as they produce. Very powerful, very sticky. But also now you have customers that are just doing solar saying, wait a minute, I want smart home. So it should be the and, not the or for us. Um, same thing with insurance. So like, wait a minute, I, mean, I got to get insurance. I need it forever, <laughs> right? Uh, I want to protect my home. That's what insurance is about. Why not protect it and enjoy it more? Uh, and why not leverage the ecosystem to allow me to get even a better rate over time? It's the and, not the or. So doubling, doubling down the core. And we think the adjacencies are helpful to help grow value to the customers, make it stickier, and also introduce new stuff. So thanks for that question. I hope that provides clarity. No, that's great. Uh, and just a final one for me. Uh, maybe I missed this, but new subscribers, especially the direct-to-home piece, was down quite a bit. Uh, could you just maybe call out what drove that drop and how did, you know, does that normalize or just, you know, maybe help explain what happened over there? Yes, we got Got this a little bit earlier, covered it a little bit. It's it's really kind of largely driven by the fact that you had in 2020, you started the selling season later, we extended all the way through into September versus this year, and we were kind of back to historical selling season, which really runs from the middle of April to kind of the middle to the end of August. So that, that, was, a, that was really a, a big driver in that on a year over year. Again, what we want to, we, it, as David said, we're investing in, in smart home. We'd like to see both those channels continue to grow double digits, um, and, and that's really where we're focused to make sure that that's what we're seeing out of those smart home growth from direct home and NIS going forward. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Come in. Thank you. And our final question comes from Brian Rattenberg from Imperial Capital. Brian, please go ahead. Your line is now open. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Congratulations on the quarter. Uh, I have a couple questions around uh, DNA. Uh, as a percentage of revenue, is about 39% uh, this quarter. Last quarter is around, you know, in the 40s, uh, 42%. Last year was 45%. Is this decrease? Uh, in DNA as a you know percentage of revenue due to the citizen bank agreement, and do you expect DNA to continue to decrease as a percentage of revenue at current levels? And then, kind of finally, to throw it all at you at once, uh, in the in the last you know period, you provided the citizens bank uh, you know uh, fees. I think it was 10.2 million last quarter, and how much is that this quarter? Yeah, Brian, I, if it's okay, I'll have Nate follow up <laughs> with you on, on the, the, the percents between DNA. I don't, I don't have all those, those data points right here in front of me that we able to give you. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, so the answer's correct. Um, and then we can, all, they can all, we can also follow up on that in terms of citizen and problem. Um, it should be in the queue later. It should be, yeah, so that should be actually in the queue later today or for everyone to have. Okay. So uh, then we can just follow up with those, and then let me just flip over then and uh, and ask a broader question. You talk about eight-year life and extending that eight-year life of uh, you know with, with these new offerings. Um, what about going into existing homes and upgrading? Is there a process that you're you know because eight years ago uh, technology was much different? I would. Imagine that's going to be the same thing, you know, eight years from now that uh, those new smart homes are not going to be so new anymore. Is there a process where you go in and upgrade uh, and charge more and provide, you know, the latest, greatest uh, hardware? Great question. Absolutely. It's uh, our core business. We've been doing it for a long time. So we have a systematic methodical upgrade 
program today. Um, we go after customers before they get to end the contract. We want to upgrade them, show them the latest and greatest, um, and that is a it's, it's core of what we do. Our operations teams are very focused on that, have been for a long time. Um, it's part of the reason why we think our attrition rate in the residential space, we think it's lower than uh, our peers, uh, so we're very proud of them. And that is a systematic program that we do and have been doing and will continue to do going forward. Yeah, I'll just add this. It's one of the actual benefits of the change we made in the citizens financing agreement was to move that to a line of credit, which is, again, makes it a little easier for, the, for our operations team as they're reaching out and upgrading these customers so the customers can actually finance that the piece of the, the hardware that's part of the upgrades. Uh, and so it definitely is a focus that we continue to kind of not, not only do it from an operational side, but make sure that we've got the tools there for, for, that allow our customers to upgrade the platform in their home and, and be able to finance that through one of our financing partners, whether it's Citizens of Fortiva. Great. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks, Gordon. Thank you. This now concludes our Q&A session. I will now hand over to David Bywater for any closing comments. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you so much for joining our call. Hopefully uh, um, this was helpful for you guys. You understand where we are and where we're going. We're very excited about the future. Uh, we've got a lot of work ahead of us. We're focused on that. Um, but uh, you can both rely upon us to continue to be thoughtful, methodical, and uh, strategic. Um, as well as with Operation Western State and the out. So appreciate it, and uh, we'll see you guys out there. Bye. Thank you, everyone. You may now disconnect your laptop.